Welcome to Movie Time Machine, where we take movies from the past and relive them in the present. This week, we travel back to the year 1980, the film The Blues Brothers, directed by John Landis, starring John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. I'm your Time Machine host, Chad, and joining me today is Chris, Jamie, Casey, and, for the first time, James. Hello. All right. Hello. What up? Welcome. Thank you for joining me this evening. All right, so what we're going to do uh, now we're going to go over a quick synopsis of the film. We'll go over some box office numbers. Then we'll go around the table. We'll do a quick review of the film. Then after that, we'll go over our top three quotes from the film. All right. So I'm going to get us started here with the synopsis. So this is coming from IMDb. The synopsis is as follows. Jake Blues, just out of prison, puts together his old band to save the Catholic home where he and brother El- Elwood were raised. As far as uh, taking a look here at the box office, actually a pretty small budget. So um, actually, I'm sorry. No, the budget was actually pretty big. So um, 27 million for budget as far as the 1980s go. That's that's pretty big. Um, Opening weekend gross domestically um, 4.8 million. Looking uh, gross domestic was fifty uh, fifty seven point two million, and then worldwide gross was one hundred and fifteen million. So, looking at a um, a budget of twenty seven million in worldwide gross was one hundred fifteen. That's not terrible. That's a great return on investment. Yeah, I know. I was just reading a big part of that budget was um, I think they purchased like ninety police cars or something like that, or seventy at four hundred bucks a pop. And I think uh, what was it the number of total cars wrecked for the film was like 106. Then when they did did the uh, Blues Brothers 2000 or the the Blues like the sequel that came out 2001 2002, um, they wrecked like 207. <laughs> it's like one more to break the record, something That's like awesome. that. <clears throat> um, other notable uh, movies that came out in 1980: uh, Star Wars: Empire Strikes Back, The Shining. Airplane, Raging Bull, Friday the 13th, Elephant Man, Caddyshack, um, a few others uh, that are um, are notable is uh, Cheech and Chong's next movie. Can I just say that 1980 is a pretty awesome year for film. Like, I'm just going down the list here, like, just some personal favorites of mine I think are really great movies. Like, we got Empire Strikes Back, 9 to 5, Stir Crazy, Airplane, Any Which Way You Can. You guys seen that film? Yeah. Clint, oh, yeah, Clint um, Eastwood. Right, was that it one. Right Turn, Clyde? Yeah. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> that was on TV all the time. Um, Coal Miner's Daughter, daughter uh, Private ben- Benjamin, Smokey and the Bandit 2. Um, Doesn't this, Popeye, isn't Flash like, Gordon one of your favorite films of all time? I want, Well, it is one of my favorites, actually. It's, right. it's a. I was told it was Blue Lagoon. Blue. Uh, that Brooke movie's Brooke terrible. Fan, right? <laughs> <laughs> Smoking hot though. Uh, no. well, that, you cannot deny. Uh, what else? Caddyshack. I mean, f- the original Friday the Thirteenth. Um. Look at that, Superman Two. I don't know, but as a kid, Superman Two was significantly better than the first one, in my opinion. Is that the one with Zod? That's the one with Zod. Yeah, I love that. That's my favorite. Yeah, Christopher Reeve Superman. Cruising, cruising for a bruising. No, cruising with Al Pacino. Have oh, you I've actually seen, seen this movie? Have I? Yeah, but it was only once. <laughs> That's like, uh, I dated this girl. No, she was from Iowa. You don't know her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something interesting about some of the ones we were going through right there. I was thinking, like, how much of that from the eighties uh, was like all SNL cast situations? Like, you look at Caddyshack. Uh, there's a couple oh, yeah, in there good with point. Uh, mm-hmm. John Candy, not necessarily SNL. I don't think John Candy. You can correct me on that one, but definitely a part in. Yeah, Blue but Chevy, right. Chevy Chase, though he was um, Chevy the Chase original, for sure. Yep, in that early SNL. Um, but it looks like quite a few just comedies in general, like where that's where it started going. Like SNL came out five years earlier, and then we started seeing all these comedies that were a little bit out of the norm. So, and that's what turned into half the eighties movies we've seen in love. Right. And I think John Landis director, I think his star was on the rise too at this time. Cause 
Animal House was 78, somewhere around there. It was pretty early, but this was not, I, I maybe like his second or third movie. So I think you're right. This is kind of the sweet spot for all those late 70s, early 80s comedy directors and actors. Yeah, you're definitely not wrong. Animal House was, uh, so 1978, so that was one of his first that came out, but Blues Brothers was his sequel to that. Uh, and then oddly enough, after that, then he went more horror, went American Werewolf in London. Oh, that's one of my what? favorite movies. Do they make like one. 500 of those films? Like <laughs> <Right>. some, <laughs> no, you're thinking of The Howling. You're thinking of The Howling. <laughs> yeah. No, American Werewolf is great. Yeah. I remember that film. All right. That's, any, anyone else have anything to add about movies in that year, 1980? All right. Um, Let's go around the table here and let's go and do our first impressions. And I'm thinking we're going to want to start with Jamie and end on this side with uh, <laughs> Chris and James from what I heard before we started recording. So uh, fair enough. I'll, I'll keep the vibes positive to get us right. going. I, <laughs> yeah, no, this was my pick. Um, I think my primary motivation was I, I'm a big horror guy, so I figured I should probably like step outside my own box and pick a comedy, just switch up the mood. Um, but I, I don't know what it is about this movie. It's just kind of like like a Reese's peanut butter cup or whatever you got like peanut butter chocolate you got comedy music it's weird like no, nothing in this movie makes sense and I think that um I, I don't know that's half the fun like you literally don't know what's going to happen if you've never seen it before and they they literally don't make movies like this anymore just let's crash 200 cop cars nobody has a plan he's probably blowing through all his money and just the primary goal is to make you laugh oh and Ray Charles is in a mu- musical scene right after Aretha Franklin. So you'll never see that again. Yeah, Casey? Yeah, so Blues Brothers, one of my uh, hands-down top ten favorite movies. I think it's uh, especially one of my favorite comedies. It's, uh, I think it's a super funny movie. Um, the, the thing that I, that I find so funny about it is that all these characters, they're just uh, especially Jake and Elwood, are kind of going through this whole chaotic mess that they're creating. First of all, for to, to say $5,000 for the orphanage they were from, which they don't even like the nun at. They didn't even enjoy being the at penguin. Uh, the, the penguin. The penguin. Her, <laughs> yeah, the penguin herself. Um, so this whole story is all about just five grand that they're trying to get. So they're bringing the band back together. And the crazier things get, it doesn't even like phase them. They just look at one point they're driving through a mall commenting on the shops that they're seeing <laughs> like, Oh, they have everything here. They have a pier one They're driving through a mall and, and just every, everyone else reacts to this chaos in an appropriate manner. Um, but they kind of go through the whole thing living in this other world. And I think, uh, a lot of those scenes where things just kind of get crazy out of hand, uh, you know, cars just flying and crashing and all those things. It just, it, it climaxes finally with this, that chaos of all those cars. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. I just think it's a it's a super unique, one of a kind type of comedy. You don't see movies made like that where you are mixing um, that same irreverent humor with uh, a little bit of you know music from the era as well. You know, getting to a lot of R and B and blues and things like that. So uh, star studded, fun family. Well, not probably not a family affair. <laughs> <laughs> Older family, uncles and, and aunts. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, All right, James. Yeah. Uh, so the yeah, first time seeing it, I it's kind of one of those when you watch the movies like this and you uh, realize like it came out, you know, or it was clearly from the in 1980 and first time seeing it. And, you know, it's almost 40 years later. Does it hold up? What are we thinking here? Uh, so for me, uh, that's where I kept on thinking. I tried to go like deeper, like was Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin in this movie? Like, were they not allowed to be in movies? Like, did was this music not something <laughs> that was, uh, like, really popular in movies then? Uh, like, what was the situation there? Uh, and, like, so I tried diving deep into that, and no, it was just, I th- it seemed like Dan Aykroyd just wanted to have a good time and do put in things that he loved into movies. So, in that aspect, I think it was a lot of fun. You're right. It was, let's wreck some cars. Let's uh, listen to music. Let's dance. Actually, that was the first thing that caught my eye. Um, as the movie's going, credits are rolling, and as I'm watching, I'm like, choreography by, and it had whoever's name. And I, it was like, 
there's gonna be choreography in this movie like what are we <laughs> what am i watching like maybe this isn't what i think it's gonna be and so then the rest of the movie all i could watch is like dan Aykroyd like doing these high knee kicks and thinking i'm like yeah that was choreographed yeah. <laughs> he did this perfectly <laughs> or like john belushi doing whatever he does and so i mean they were clearly had a blast doing the movie for me it was just an okay film uh but it i can't deny how much fun they probably had making this movie and clearly from going box office gro- uh gross like like uh, that paved the rest of their way to do whatever they wanted as far as screenplays, acting, directing, whatever. So, I mean, good for them. Just uh, wasn't necessarily my thing. I don't know if it's not going to be a go to movie on a rainy day by any means for me, though. Right. Yeah, I'd probably agree with James on this. I think it looked like it was a movie that was a lot of fun to record and make and do. Uh, but as far as like um, this is my first time viewing this. So I, I look at it and I thought. It was, I mean, it was a huge cast. I love Dan Aykroyd. I thought it was really cool. You had to get Aretha Franklin to get, um, to get Ray Charles in there, to get James Brown. I mean, the, the musical acts that they were able to convince to be in this movie is pretty, um, pretty amazing, but it just kind of fell flat for me. Um, I felt like there wasn't a lot, um, Casey, you were talking a little bit about like driving the story. I think it was more so like helping the orphanage, like not helping the orphanage, but helping like Curtis that their guy that like it seemed like was kind of the individual that showed them the way and like showed them like who they were but i feel like that was the driver and like he was in that in that movie very little i just i don't know for me it seemed like yeah it was just lacking depth and lacking some um some real driving pieces but i mean it was a fun watch i would agree i probably wouldn't Like, this isn't a movie that I would need to watch again or really, like, spend a lot of time, like, seeking out. I've seen bits and pieces of it, you know, on TBS or TNT, but this is the first time I've seen it the full way through. And, um, yeah, I just felt like throughout the entire movie, like, it's a a two-and-a-half-hour movie, and I, like, I felt like it could have been done in an hour and a half, and that would have been a much better movie. (laughs) Yeah, I think the movie is long. Um, Yeah. But if you just watch the theatrical version, it is only 215. The unrated is the two and a half hour. Sorry, Chris. No, that's fair. I did watch the extended version. Okay. I watched the theatrical version. And I think I kind of fall in between uh, both sides here of what we've heard so far. Um, I think this movie really captures a lot of, like, what we see in, like, comedy films, like, going into the 80s. Like... There's some like the hijinks is very similar. Like when I think of like movies like Smokey and the Bandit or like Cannonball Run, there's something that's oddly f- familiar and similar between those films and that style of comedy. Um, I do think it's a little bit long. There's some things that probably been cut up and should have been cut out of it. But um, again, that might be just looking at it through like today's lens versus like, you know, um, what that movie was at the time. But I think this movie probably is a, a very important film though for comedy of like what, what it opened up for the eighties and like a lot of great films that I think we got because of what this movie did. Um, I, I do like it, but I think the, this movie is like, it's like great segments with like some filler, like in between that doesn't really do much. I think for the plot, um, I think this is a movie, like I think you should see, but it's not like a movie that I'm going to go back and rewatch. Like there's, you know, Nothing that's going to drive me to go back and rewatch this film. The, the one of the more important things for me is is just like the movie cameos, um, just like the the talent, like the blues legends that are in this film. I just I did like I think I probably saw this maybe I was like under the age of ten, so the the weight of those characters in that film just didn't hit me until I went back and watched it again um, this time. So, which I'm really glad I got the go back and actually have like feel that and see these characters in the film and just like, wow, I didn't realize who that was. I didn't remember that they were in this film. So yeah. So I kind of fall in between. I think I would recommend this film like just for its history, but it's again, it's not something I'm going to go back and rewatch. You talk a little bit about the importance of this movie and the importance of this comedy to, to kind of bridge that gap and allow for more comedies to come in the future. Talk to me a little bit about your thoughts, because the way that I look at this, like this movie was just okay for me. If I were to make that argument, 
a movie that came out the same year, that would be Caddyshack. I think Caddyshack did it so yeah, much true, better. True. And I think Caddyshack, true. like I look at Caddyshack and I can like that is a rewatchable movie for me. I can watch oh, yeah. it all the time. Yeah. I think it's really funny. Like there are laugh out loud bits for me. Right. So I'm curious, like when you look at like both of those movies coming out um, in the same year, what is it about? I, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, and, and I don't mean to do that. No, I just think curious. it's like, like it's, it's something about like the music a, and like the film, and that's like there's a reason why the music in that film I think has kind of stuck in like popular culture throughout the times, and that's something I just can't deny the fact of. Mm-hmm. But I do agree, like Caddyshack is that's probably hands down like one of the best. It's up there with the upper echelon of of comedies because yeah, any absolutely. any great comedies, modern comedies, I think you get like owes a lot to Caddyshack. <laughs> As well, like Caddyshack, like um, I randomly was just because I think it was just on Netflix not too long ago that that it popped up on there, and I was just listening to like the first fifteen minutes of that film, (laughs) and like hearing like the detail like of every sentence of Chevy Chase and like those (laughs) opening scenes, like (laughs) just so fucking random, but it's just like comedy gold. So yeah, Yeah. I I I do get what you're saying there. That's it. Caddyshack probably does hold. More way as far as like influence, but uh, but Chad, to your point, here's the thing I was kind of thinking of as you were saying, like it's paving, it was paving the way. As you, as of when I was watching scenes for the first time, I again try to go back to this is an older movie. Like, is this the first time we've seen such things? Like the elevator scene, the girl from Ipanina in the background, and they're going up the elevator and seemingly taking ten minutes to get to the fifth floor or whatever they need to get to. How many times does that happen in? so many movies over the course of time now uh even like just the scenes where uh blue she's doing like backflips uh, like down like uh the center of the church like to get up to the front start dancing and things like that it, I, like all i kept on thinking was like roger rabbit and like anything that like farley would do uh it's just little things like that where i was trying to think outside of the box like yeah the, i could see where different scenes would uh, portray or have been used in other movies like it might not have been the comedy gold Caddyshack was in writing necessarily but the scenes were all there where all everybody in that uh, time and going forward like loved something about it and I and uh, they either used it again and perfected it or just used it because of the nostalgia who knows but I could see that and I want to push back on you guys too because I, not to be contrarian, but because Chris, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to go the other way with Caddyshack because I do, I do love it, but it's not, you know, it's number two to Blues Brothers number one. I'm, I'm the opposite of you guys. And I think, um, with that being said, Rodney Dangerfield, his scenes in Caddyshack are still funnier to me than anything in the Blues Brothers or Caddyshack. But yeah, I go the other way and I, I don't have any real reason other than kind of what you guys were saying about blues brothers. It just, it doesn't grab me in that same funny way as to whatever, you know, um, Ackroyd and Belushi are just doing, dancing around being goons. Right. The thing with the Caddyshack though, this kind of, you kind of made me think about this is like Caddyshack kind of has like one of those comedy. It's like one of those, you know, comedies that start out really strong. Then they kind of wane towards like the middle and like it's the end, like something like pops, but like where I feel like blues brothers has like, a steady like it's it's kind of more steady throughout the entire film as far as like great comedy goes which is like caddyshack i feel like really like lulls maybe towards like the middle Mm -hmm. like half or middle of the movie you know what i'm saying yeah i would i would agree with that well enough to pile on to that argument but if thinking about caddyshack the main driving part of that movie the what the teenage boy you know in his summer job yada yada Honestly, that's the most boring part of the movie. You, you're watching that movie for Bill Murray, for Chevy Chase, right. for Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah. So the, the driving force of that movie, eh, take it or leave it. Whereas the Blues Brothers, you're watching this epic car crash unfold in two and a half hours, to your point, kind of long. Um, but it really just kind of escalates. It's like a snowball going downhill where it finally culminates with, with that great crescendo at the end. And so I just think it's a really fun ride because it's kind of... You start off a little bit slow. You're going to the church, you know, meeting with the nun, finding out you got cash Penguin. you got to go find. Thank you, <laughs> Penguin. Uh, you know, getting the band back together. You know, it just kind of slowly builds and builds, and then it becomes kind of a race towards the finish line. So I think, again, not trying to compare the two because I love Caddyshack and I love Blues Brothers, um, but I could see that to be an argument as to, you know, the driving force of Blues Brothers is the Blues Brothers. So I guess if you don't find them humorous and in, in uh, you know, their, their kind of dry humor and uh, vapidness where they're just kind of living this world and not really 
interacting with it in the same way the rest of us do. Um, if you're not super, if, if that's not like funny to you, then I could see why the whole movie then would maybe fall flat. Whereas Caddyshack saved, if you like, at least two thirds of, of the people in the movie. You know, back to cultural like impact too. Like just looking at box office, domestic box office, Blues Brothers made almost twenty million dollars more in the box office in and it was in let me see here five hundred something theaters, five hundred ninety four theaters, and Caddyshack was in six hundred fifty six theaters. So it was in like almost like one hundred fifty more theaters. And still didn't make. I mean, I'm not looking at like timing of release too. That might have something to do with it, but just a little. And sad. Caddyshack didn't make as much money as the Blues Brothers domestically for that year. Really, that surprises me because, as you know, I, I a millennial, I guess to put a point on you know my era, decade, age, whatever. I, I'm under the impression that everybody has seen Caddyshack they came and their out father like a month apart. Yeah, but. During but, summer. Yeah, but if Blues Brothers made more money, I guess I just grew up with the knowledge that everyone knew about Caddyshack and had seen it like 50 times, you know? Right. I think Blues Brothers were just so huge because of the SNL ties because they were so huge. And that actually leads me to my next point because Chris was saying, uh, you know, you didn't see the importance of the movie. You know, what did it do for comedy? But I think the real big thing to remember is how huge John Belushi was back then. And if it weren't for things like this, and, and obviously his career was, you know, cut short. And if it weren't for things like this, I don't think we would have seen the popularity in the 90s of things like uh, Chris Farley and Cone Adam heads. Sandler. Well, well, that's <laughs> <laughs> you just threw out the week. <laughs> sure. Yes, on purpose. On purpose. OK. But just like some of those other stars. Some of those other stars that kind of grew and, and kind of created the comedy scene that we've seen now. I mean, none of the Mike Myers, Austin Powers movies probably would have been made because that was another one of those same kind of same vein. Well, I don't know if I I don't know if I agree with that. Part of where my thought process is, is I feel like in and I would have to do some digging on this, but you're probably right in the regard of like that helped kind of pave the way. But I also think like Chevy Chase being in. I think Caddyshack, Caddyshack was a way that like helped Chevy Chase really um, grow his career and like grow his um, prominence. And I think of like movies like basically like National Lampoons. You know, I know that John Belushi did Animal House, but I also think like one of the movies that I constantly, constantly go go to is like you know Christmas Vacation, like European Vacation, like all of those movies. And I think that also had a huge portion of it. But I don't know like where they like where they are within like the scope of like release and what had more influence over I mean so less more, about the movies that came out but more about like who he influenced and who came out because sure. of him being an actor and finding success Sure yeah and I think like the like the Chris Farley absolutely and like yeah the SNL crew yeah I think he was early like him and Dan Aykroyd um were were early to kind of be able to create that Uh so what I'm taking actually out of this Chris is what good comedy is to you is it needs full frontal. One hundred percent. Okay, so yeah. full frontal nudity. Got it. Yeah, yeah. That's why I love uh, forgetting Sarah Marshall so much. That movie sucks. You know, like, <laughs> oh no! Um, oh come on! <laughs> King of unpopular opinions. Oh. I hate that movie. Um, oh, so you forgot so all wrong. about it then? <laughs> I did. I just lost my thought. I had um, uh, oh, what I was what I was just thinking of was is that does anybody know like at this time and like again we're not like film school people, but like what were like were like comedians becoming actors like was that as like I think as an, it, like again like I couldn't speak to this really well, but yeah. it does feel certainly with that timeline of the eighties that. SNL paved the way for comedians to have that opportunity uh, to do that and then move into movies. Like they thought it was funny. Everybody was loving that's, SNL. Yeah, kind of I think it's I get much of Casey's feeling yeah. on that where everybody was like, what ideas were you on? So when you went like Caddyshack, it's like the same director as Ghostbusters. So clearly all these guys kept on working together, hanging out in clubs and just started talking stuff like how else would you figure out Ghostbusters if you weren't doing coke somewhere? I may not have. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, my my knowledge on comedians before 1980 is not great. I don't know, like prior but, and well, well, yeah, but like I'm, I'm thinking so like if prior's you know, still like he his his uh, prime though is probably 
more in the 80s, early 80s. I would say I, he had one like 70s, 70s stand up special yeah. that was pretty famous. I yeah. can't think of the name, but it but was I on Netflix know, like, not too long ago. Was it Silver Streak that came out in 80? I do know, James, I think you're right because what <laughs> what I've been doing lately is um, I, I have Hulu and they have a bunch of old SNL seasons. They don't have all of them, but I just said, you know, what the hell? I'm going to start from season one because I'd never seen it. And it seems to be kind of like this great gathering place. I mean, episode one is George Carlin and Andy Kaufman each doing like 10 to 12 minutes, you know, more than once. So I think it did become this gathering place for all of these guys who suddenly had, you know, a platform and a stage to kind of get their comedy out there more broadly. All right. Just doing a quick reference. It looks like we have like Richard Pryor. He was in silver street that came out in 76, but I, I mean, from my memory, I, like the comedians becoming actors things. I feel like eight. Told you so. <laughs> no, well, like uh, Steve Martin was kind of a thing uh, in the oh, late yeah. the 70s. Jerk. The jerk. Yeah. And, yeah. But so that would almost say that, you know, Same. Belushi and, and Aykroyd weren't really the first SNL. to come out of SNL. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, you that's know, they certainly kept that going. Yeah, it's a really good call out. Awesome. This is, I think this is the first time any of us have sat down and had like this big of a... Uh, Disagreement? A disagreement. That's good. We can't all be friends all the time. That's right. Well, cool. What were we disagreeing about? <laughs> uh, so well, just uh, we were talking about like domestic gross and all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing I was looking at on IMDb, uh, just because it's not, I don't know if that's true facts or not. Sorry. I don't know if that's true facts or not, uh, if I just to quote IMDb. But one thing I looked at in the trivia was, according to Dan Aykroyd, cocaine was included in the film's budget. So maybe that's Oh, yeah, I, I read that, too. Yep. Um, which I thought was <laughs> a fun fact, maybe not disclosed. Or they were just like, man, you guys must really love Pop-Tarts. Like, and that's how it was under the budget. Uh, I just thought that was uh, just a fun fact. that, Or maybe that was a common practice. But on there, they just said that. Um, Belushi enjoyed it the most, but also uh, he thought it enhanced his performance, which I thought was also interesting because he had very little lines. <laughs> right, right. Physical Did he have Yeah. 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 <laughs> lines on the page, yeah, right? right? Makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. They were powdered donuts on the rider, yeah. I think. Powdered donuts make me go nuts. <laughs> um, um, yeah, another fun fact I came across was the mall scene. I think... Where that mall was located outside of Chicago, it had been closed down. And I think, like, the area that it was in, it was, like, lots of crime and not being able to keep any business in there. And so that's why they were able to set up, like, these shops, just run, like, rampage through this, like, actual mall. And I guess there's, like, YouTube videos up, out there of, like, people that have recreated that mall scene. <laughs> we have to look it up, but it's out there if anyone wants to take a look at that. Yeah, I was reading something about that mall scene, too, and they were saying, it, yeah, it was an abandoned mall, so then they made it look nice, and everybody in the neighborhood got so excited because they thought the it mall was, was reopening. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and instead, it was for this scene, and then apparently uh, in that uh, scene, they caused more or a bunch of damage, that, or they didn't return it to the way the mall looked before they got in there but there was no agreement that they would pay for damages because it was an abandoned mall so there was like a fight going on back and forth until they finally just demolished the mall <laughs> wow. did anyone else oh. notice the super meta thing going on like they're in toys r us that doesn't exist anymore there's pier one that's gone too i don't know i kind of had fun with that thanks amazon <laughs> yeah right <laughs> wah, 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 wah. Uh, since we're talking about uh, fun facts, again, one more thing that I read I thought was interesting or just kind of fun was uh, Jim Belushi had a ten or John Belushi, sorry, had a tendency to go missing in uh, the from time nice. to time uh, at night and everything. So, the, yeah, there was like one time where he was missing in a scene and Dan Eckerd was looking around and saw only one house in the area with lights on. So on a whim, walked over there, fully ready to knock on the door and be like, hey. I'm Dan Aykroyd. Uh, we're filming this movie, and this guy opens the door, and before he can even say a word, he's like, you're looking for John Belushi, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and apparently he got in. The, the guy said he came in and asked for a glass of milk and a sandwich and then cra ended up crashing on his couch. <laughs> and so that's, One of four fried chickens. <laughs> yeah, right. Four fried chickens. So Dan Aykroyd dubbed him America's guest after that. <laughs> Do you want to, does anybody have, like, a favorite scene they want to share before we get into... Um, Movie quotes? Uh, it's not. I, no further explanation than Ray's Music Shop. That musical number is my favorite by far. A lot of choreography. 
Yeah, there's no your one. choreography. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Casey? Oh, man. Uh, you know, I don't know if that I have a favorite. Uh, I really actually do like the song and dance in the church uh, and then the whole, you know, the, seeing the light and that whole bit. I think that whole thing is just super funny. Yeah, James Brown being the preacher. Yeah, yeah it's, well, that's, I love that scene a lot. Favorite scenes. Uh, actually, my wife, before she went to sleep and we started watching it, she's like, is that guy wearing a wig? And I'm like, dude, I'm like, babe, that's James Brown. And she's like, oh, yeah, that's James Brown. I'm like, I'm like, caught her off guard. Um, I I would say that uh, the musical numbers for sure, clearly the best in the uh, movie, the more arbitrary scenes, uh, the uh Illinois Nazis, uh, not that scene, but when they are, they fly off the bridge and then are falling through Chicago, like from the height of <laughs> right, skyscrapers. Right, right. Um, I was just watching it. I'm like, how long is this going to last? Know, and how was the car staying so perpendicular? Right. But, but it looked like it was a really great shot for yeah. the 80s. I'm like, man, Star Wars, watch out. Right. <laughs> I've always loved you. I know. And doesn't that scene too, when they're like um, getting chased and they get to the end of the bridge and like the bridges collapse there and like the car like backflips <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i think for me one of the scenes that i really enjoyed the most was <clears throat> the scene where they were um getting ready to introduce the blues brothers or like basically they were stalling for the blues brothers and they have like that big scene where they're doing the like the moochie whatever the moocher. Yeah, yeah yeah um and i love like they made it like look really kind of glitzy and glamoury and glamorous and then by the time it ends you can kind of just see them like on the stage and there's like very little there and they're all just wearing <laughs> their like normal clothes i thought that was a really great scene i really like the the song as well yeah i, lo- I really like that scene i like the james brown scene too just yeah, I love James Brown being mm-hmm. the preacher. But all right, that was awesome. Great review. Um, let's go around and let's do our favorite quotes from the film. We're going to do our top three. Um, we'll, we'll start at our number three and work our way up to number one, and we'll just go around the table for each round. Um, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and start this one off instead of always being the one that, that finishes. Hey, you do. So. All right. So uh, my number three is we're on a mission from God. <laughs> I, just, I mean, that quotes in the movie, like, you know, multiple times, but I just love it. It's, it's one of those things I think in pop culture is kind of stuck around. So yeah. the way Dan Aykroyd says it we're on a mission from God. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody know off the top of your heads? I, was, I didn't look it up yet. Like, where's Aykroyd from? Is it Chicago? He's like, Canadian. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, as you know, I was trying to think from his accent. I, it was like, he's got to be Canadian, but I never looked it up. But I was curious because of how, yeah, he was, yeah. God. God. <laughs> yeah. God. Not too far off, though, on like the Chicago. China, Midwest. Midwest. Mm-hmm. All right. Jamie. Me. Okay. Um, mine are in no particular order. Mine, my first one is when they're in um, the Soul Food Cafe and Aretha Franklin says, we got two honkies out there dressed like Hasidic diamond merchants. <laughs> and then her husband goes, Jake Elwood. <laughs> That's my number three. That's pretty good. Uh, my number three, it kind of goes along the lines that I, uh, of my review earlier where I just love it that they're so unaware of like where what they're really doing and what's really going on around them. They just seem so absent-minded. Um, it's a scene after they're, I believe, in the phone booth and Carrie Fisher blows them up and they go flying. They land on the ground and the first thing Elwood says, he looks over and goes, hey, hey Jake, got to be at least $7 with the change here. <laughs> <laughs> You know about that that scene too, like when she's shooting like the rockets, it's like it's like laser fire from like like Star Wars. It's like choo, choo, choo. Um, I think uh, mine was uh, I guess super arbitrary one, but uh, when they hit up the country uh, music place and they're like, "What kind of music do you usually have here?" <laughs> the lady's like, "Oh, we got both kinds. We got country." And Western. Yeah. <laughs> and then they start playing the TV show theme song. Yep. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Rolling, rolling, yeah. rolling. <laughs> it also, that scene also led me to believe uh, between that and um, Roadhouse that all ba- all bars in the 80s must have chain link fence to block uh, the, glass bottles. Right. That's right. kind of what I took from that as well. I never Country gla- bars. Glass bottles broke so easy in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so for me, my number three, again, also in no, like, real order. Uh, but I thought uh, 
when they were being chased towards the end and they were saying, uh, the, the dispatcher was saying, use of unnecessary violence in the apprehension of the Blues Brother has been approved. <laughs> uh, for number two, for me, um, same as James there, the country and western quote it just sounds like something i would hear from my family (laughs) 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 growing up growing up what kind of music did you grow up with country and western both kinds okay um my two is a bit of a back and forth between jake and elwood and it's super simple i it's i think it's one of my favorites because this is something me and my friends just say to each other um shit what rollers no yeah shit <laughs> there's not much to it i don't know it's, i think it's just something we say to each other that's it that's perfect uh my number two uh it's actually a lot of quotes because it's the scene where they're they're getting beat by the penguin because they keep cursing oh. but finally <laughs> uh i think it's elwood falls down on the, or no jake falls out of the chair and, and they're being reprimanded for swearing and just goes fuck this shit man <laughs> <laughs> I really like when, like, the penguin asks him, what did you just say? And he goes through the entire part. <laughs> yeah. like, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, so I guess oh, only because it just caught me off guard with being a part or being a part of the movie. Like, where do Illinois Nazis come from? But for sure, the Illinois Nazis. I hate Illinois Nazis. Uh, I don't know. It just Those two had such great chemistry that when they did scenes like you just suggested, uh, they, it just flowed so well together where like they were just like finishing each other's sandwiches <laughs> um for me uh my number two i really liked when um jay got out l um elwood grabbed him brought him to his apartment uh and they're just starting to get like comfortable and the train keeps going by and so elwood <laughs> asks, how often does the train go by <laughs> <laughs> or I'm sorry, Jake asks, how often does a train go by? And Elwood's response is, so often that you won't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, one of my last quotes is the uh, where Elwood go, goes, the 106 miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. <laughs> <laughs> oh Yeah, I, when I heard that, I was like, that had to have been on the poster at some point, like in its time or like the 25th anniversary. It had it's to be on right the, there. The, the cover. VHS cover. VHS, is, is it really? It? I don't know. I'm oh, just I was gonna say, <laughs> oh, yeah. It had to have been, right? <laughs> it's a great tagline. <laughs> so I think uh, my number one, it always, it just kills me. I forget it's in there. It's when, um, I think it's the first chase and uh, John Candy and the cops land in the truck and <laughs> he's like, give me the mic. What car are we? Five, five. This is car 55. We're in a truck. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, so my favorite uh, my favorite quote comes from the scene when they're in the restaurant trying to recruit one of the bandmates who's working there at the restaurant, and they're just trying to mess with all the rich people there. And at one point, Jake stands up, and, he, and I'm going to do my best impression. He goes, uh, how much for the little girl? How much for the well, women? Yeah. <laughs> and the guy's super confused, like, what? And so he just keeps going with it. Your women. I want to buy your women. The little girl, your daughters. Sell them to me. Sell me your children. <laughs> it's just so absurd just that they're messing with all these rich people in such a crazy way. Uh, yeah, I really don't. The first one that Chad said uh, about 160 miles of Chicago, I think that one really just caught my attention um, throughout the rest of the movie. I kind of wish it was earlier, and I was like, oh, something's going to be happening. It's going to be awesome. But they did save it for the end, and it was great. But uh, I thought if it was earlier, I think I would have been, it would have set up the tone for the rest of the movie in some way. All right. Chris? All right. My final one, uh, I really, really liked when uh, they towards the the very end when they were doing their singing for the um for kind of the the banquet or whatever the um like when they're playing in the barn or whatnot uh and all the cops roll in and they finally notice them um and so then they make sure the blues brothers make sure that they acknowledge them by saying and we'd like to especially welcome all the representatives of the illinois law uh, <laughs> of illinois law department um community that have chosen to join us here in the palace hotel ballroom at this time and i think it's just really tongue-in-cheek and like just it sh- continues to show kind of their like just absurdness all right awesome i just had one more i wanted to mention here was the uh it's like when they're trying to get the 
the band back together and I can't remember which which character it was, but uh they're talking about like how good their band used to be. He says we had a band powerful enough to turn goat piss into gasoline. <laughs> 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 All right, does anybody else uh anyone else have something they want to add about Blues Brothers or you said your piece? Said my piece. Yeah, it's a decent movie. Did anyone, did anyone see Blues Brothers 2000? I've never seen Awful. that movie. Awful. Do not waste your time. Okay. Awful. It is. It, it does nothing but terrible things to the name of Blues Brothers. I didn't get okay. past the it. movie poster. <laughs> That's that awful. Just to, to give you <laughs> some perspective, so it's not Isn't John Goodman in that? John. John Goodman and uh, one of the blue. There's like four Blues Brothers in this one, and one oh. of them is a child. So Ooh. it's almost like an awful kids movie remake yeah. of it. Understood. Like the Disney version. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks, guys, for... It'd be cool if like, the kid was, one. like, doing lines of coke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he probably was. <laughs> right. You got to get on the level, kid. Uh, fun fun fact, actually, I, we, this didn't get mentioned, that uh, Frank Oz, Yoda, was uh, the guy giving back all of his stuff in the very beginning, like, going, here's your uh, contraceptive, unused, here's a used one, <laughs> which also was a funny scene. But that was, uh, that was Frank, that was Yoda. Oh, wow. Oh. I didn't catch that. Yeah. Sweet. Do you know who Yoda is, Chris? Who? Oh. It's funny that, you, that you, a few of you have said you don't think it's a rewatchable film because there was probably a six-month period where I watched this movie once a month. I, lo- I will watch this movie all the time. I love this film. What age, though? Like, oh, like a few years ago. I'm with you on that, Maybe Casey. six years ago in my 20s. I actually never saw it when I was a kid. I found this in my 20s. I'm with you on that. I could watch this every year, every couple months. I'll I'll give you I'll give you a pass. That's why I was kind of curious when everybody <laughs> watched some of these things. Like I appreciate the chat said like what ten you thought. I was pretty young. I was probably like seven, eight. Yeah, no, I, I actually. I probably, the funny thing is, I saw Blues 2000 before I saw this. Hated it, and then didn't give this one the time of day. To watch yeah, it. found this as an adult, and and I love it. Because I could say on a similar situation a couple years back, I actually found Goonies for the first time, which everybody had seen. And, but then I watched Goonies probably like once a month because I loved it. It's so good. It's so good. So good. I don't really like Goonies. No, I'm just kidding. I, 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 I was thinking yeah, Chris, Chris, Chris Goonies. Chris doesn't like Unpopular the Goonies. Unpopular take. Come on. Unpopular uh, opinion. I, I, hold on. Hold on. Everybody describe <laughs> Chris's facial expression. <laughs> uh, grimace? <laughs> no, I just I haven't seen it in its entirety. Like the, what I've seen on TBS, it just it seems really kiddy. It seems all right. <laughs> Man. You watch a lot of TBS. <laughs> <laughs> not well, a sponsor. Hashtag not a sponsor. <laughs> as a kid. Absolutely. It's the only channel we had. <laughs> it's a cable Are you channel. smarter than a fifth grader? <laughs> Reruns. Thanks, man. Oh. All right. Well, thank you. That concludes our episode. Our look into the movie The Blues Brothers. If you have any thoughts, comments, you want to join in or chime in on your thoughts on the Blues Brothers, send us a message at Movie Machine Pod on Twitter. That's at Movie Machine Pod on Twitter. Thank you and good day.